Um, my presentation is called Dark Technology, and um, I'm going to take you on a short journey. And at the end, I have a call to action. Um, so bear with me. I'll take about 10 minutes of your time. So we know that in the last 30 years, technology has had a massive transformational impact on our lives. Um, we know that we all have smartphones now, and we know that those smartphones allow us to connect with each other. They allow us to entertain ourselves. They allow us to find our partners. They allow us sometimes to do things that we shouldn't do. Um, and some people would say that actually technology in some respects has come between us a little bit. But there's no doubt it has had an incredibly positive impact on our lives. And what's interesting is that 10 years ago, we didn't have the iPhone. So that technological change has happened at an incredibly fast pace. And can you imagine your lives today without your laptops or without your smartphones? And so we have a really interesting and really comfortable coexistence with technology. Um, we're able to, um, each day, use technology without thinking about it. We wake up in the morning, the first thing that we reach for is our smartphone. And the last thing that we touch sometimes when we go to bed at night, especially if you're single, is your smartphone. <laughs> and in fact, even our cats sometimes, they, are, they appreciate the warm glow of our electronics devices. And so there's a very comfortable coexistence between people and technology. And that's at a sort of basic level. That's at a level which is really about us having fun and managing our daily lives. What's interesting, though, is that it's easy for us to forget how fast these things change. Believe it or not, this is a statement from Steve Ballmer. Steve Ballmer was, at the time, um, the number two at Microsoft. He became the number one at Microsoft. This is what he said about the iPhone when he was interviewed in September of 2007. He said, it's ridiculous. There's no market for that. No one is ever going to buy one. And so the reason I mention that is that just having the back of your minds the fact that the pace of technological change moves faster than our ability to comprehend it. And that's a challenge. That's a problem. And I'll come back to why I think that's a problem. So I talked about how technology has affected our daily lives. And I think we all understand that. But also, it's had a more profound impact on our lives as human beings. Um, we now have mapped the human genome, which allows us to consider doing things such as gene splitting, splicing, and editing to eradicate dangerous diseases, congenital diseases. Um, some of us have health trackers that allow us to know exactly how long we've been asleep, not very long in my case, about four hours a day, that allow us to understand how many steps we've taken, even our heartbeat. I can tell you that my heart was about 80 beats per minute before I got on stage. So that's a profound example of where technology has really helped us. And actually, technology has done a great job of extending human life. Life expectancy for somebody born today in London, for example, is about 100 years old. And technology has played a very important part in that. So I don't want you to think that I don't like technology. I've built a very good career doing technology. It would be hypocritical of me to say that technology is not great. The difficulty is that um, there are in the dark fringes of the IT industry, of the technology industries. There are some things happening that I think you should know about, um, and some things happening that I believe are a possible threat to the existence of humanity. Now, that sounds very dramatic. Some of you are smiling at me as if to say, this guy's crazy. Well, let's just explore that. I think what's interesting is that um, I believe that we're at the beginning of the dawn of the next phase in the coexistence between human beings and technology. And I call that, potentially call that, the dark technology age. And what do I mean by that? One of the things that's interesting is that in Silicon Valley, there are organizations that are building, for example, robots that are being used as police officers. Now, some of you might seem excited about that. That sounds great, doesn't it? But I've met some of these people. And what's interesting about these people is that their view on humanity is not one that may be consistent with our view on humanity. I shared a taxi with one of the senior engineers for one of these companies that shall remain nameless. And he explained to me that he was very excited about the work that he was doing. He said, wouldn't it be fantastic to have these robots? They would stop those guys from East Palo Alto coming to our neighborhoods. He said, wouldn't that be fantastic? We could just say, if anybody comes from that zip code to this zip code, stop them. And he thought that was fantastic. And it was an interesting taxi ride, because he was quite a scary character. 
and I didn't want to get on the wrong side of him, but it suddenly dawned on me that this is quite an interesting thing in that this activity is happening in these dark shadows at the edges of the IT industry that not many people know about, but millions and millions of dollars and pounds of investment are going into these spaces. Um, and I thought, well, is it too scary if there's robots going around doing policing in these dodgy neighborhoods? And maybe that's not too much of a problem. But then our conversation moved on. And he wanted to talk to me about some of the more exciting stuff that is happening. And he said, one of the things that he is working on, was working on, was the use of what he described as civil unrest suppression. Does that sound good? Do you want some civil unrest suppression? Will you invest in that? Well, what's interesting is that one of the companies that's heavily involved in this is Google. And in fact, there are now drones being tested that can follow suspicious people. So perhaps if some profiling or some data mining has identified that people with red hair are dangerous, that's OK, because we can get the drones to follow them. We can keep an eye on those people. And then if they get a little bit rowdy, that's OK, because some of these prototype drones have been fitted with things such as tear gas. So that's great, because then there's going to be no police officers harmed in the pursuit of this civil unrest suppression, because we'll leave it to the drones. And actually, some of the drones are now armed. Just imagine a scenario whereby there is this civil unrest, which of course is a relative term. Who decides if it's good or bad? Who makes the decision about whether that civil unrest is something that is acceptable or unacceptable? So I left the taxi feeling a little bit concerned. And I did some research, because I thought maybe this guy is not telling the truth. Um, and what I found was quite interesting. This picture is um, from last year, so 2015. This is US Marines at the Quantico uh, Marine Training Facility in the United States. They are on a military training exercise with a robot provided by Google. It's a military robot provided by Google. Google acquired the technology through the purchase of a company called Boston Dynamics. Boston Dynamics is an interesting company that made most of its money selling a military hardware to the US government. And so that's interesting. So the truth is, this is happening. There are companies, companies that we know, that are building technology with the explicit aim of being used to control human beings. I'm not passing any judgment on that. I'm just telling you what's happening. Some of you may think that's great. Some of you do think it's great. So what I want you to think about, though, is, is this right? And are you comfortable with this? And if you're comfortable with this, then I apologize in advance for wasting 10 minutes of your time. But if you're not, what are we going to do about it? Because from my perspective, I think that many years ago, people understood that if robot technology was going to advance to the point at which it could be as powerful as it is today, we needed to put some rules in place to manage that technology. So Isaac Asimov, a genius of his time, back in 1942, defined what he described as the laws of robotics. And the first law of robotics was this, that a robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. That was one of the three rules in the universe of robotics that he created. And any of you that have read those books would know that his stories tested what would happen if these laws didn't exist. What would happen if robots didn't subscribe to these laws and if this wasn't something that was in their programming? So if you go back to my earlier slide, you can see the problem, because we're actually building robots with the explicit aim of not protecting people, but actually potentially harming people. And I think that could be a problem. And so who decides how this technology gets used? From the looks of bewilderment on your faces, most of you didn't know this was happening. Um, but it is happening, and it is happening on a very large scale. Millions and millions of dollars are being invested in this technology. So the question to you is, who will decide if that's right? And if that technology continues to persist, who will decide if that technology is being used appropriately? Do you trust your governments to do that? No, nope, there's a few giggles in the room. Um, so who do you trust? Because it's either big corporations that are building the technology, 
or it is the governments who are giving the money to the big corporations. Your money, by the way. Your money, tax dollars and tax pounds. So who will decide? And I think for me that this is why I talk about this potential dark age of technology, because it's not far away. Remember, 10 years ago, we did not have the iPhone. And even when it was released in 2007, some people said, that's never going to take off. Some of you might be saying, I don't think that stuff's going to take off. Looks a bit far-fetched. Remember the iPhone. And so my concern is that I don't think this technology should become a tool by which the powerful can control the weak. So just go back to that conversation in my taxi with that guy, that senior engineer in Silicon Valley, who was telling me how excited he was that his technology could stop those sketchy people coming to his neighborhood. So that's a case of people who are powerful potentially using technology to control people who are weak. I'm not comfortable with that. So let's go back to why I moved into the technology industry many years ago, years before many of you were born, because I'm that old. Uh, I think that technology should be used to solve the problems that humanity faces today, because there are some problems that humanity faces today. And those problems include hunger. There are billions of people going hungry today. Poverty. There are millions and millions of people who are in poverty and injustice everywhere we turn in the world today, whether it is injustice in the United States or in the developing world. There is injustice at every turn. And my belief is that we should use technology, particularly digital and information technology, to address those problems. We shouldn't be using the technology to cement and to crystallize the social orders that there are today. Because let's remember, there is enough food in the world for everybody. There is enough land in the world for everybody. But yet still, the distribution of our resources means that many people face the problems that I just talked about. And are we happy that technology could be used to actually exacerbate those inequalities and then to lock them into place? Now, some of you will have seen those dystopian science fiction films where there are neighborhoods where people can and can't go. But remember, that's what that engineer was talking to me about. That is what he wants. That is what he is being funded to develop today. It will happen if we don't do something about it. So what can we do to have a future world that is more equal, where technology is enabling people, where technology is actually tackling some of these social problems? I don't think it's too difficult. I, for example, I invest in social tech or tech for good because there are people out there who are using their technology skills, their engineering skills to do great things for humanity, whether it be the printing of 3D prosthetic limbs in parts of Africa, or whether it be people who are looking at ways in which we can reduce waste and protect the environment using 3D printing of clothes instead of buying clothes. These are things that are fantastic uses of technology. But there's a problem. And the problem is this. There's no profit in it. There is no profit from doing good with technology. Using technology to solve these problems is not going to happen if we allow the markets to decide, if we allow the governments to decide. The only way that we can use technology to fix these problems is if we, the people, make it clear that that is what we want, if we decide that that is what we should do. And the truth is, if we don't, then we will enter this dark age. We are the only people that can stop it. And so I'm going to wrap up with just one thought for you. I think that there is a danger that we will sleepwalk into this dark technology age where some of us will be fine because we live in nice neighborhoods and we have nice jobs and we went to nice universities and the technology will protect us because it will keep us separate from the people that we decide are undesirable, from the poor, from the people that don't look like us, from the people that potentially have a different religion. One of the things that I heard recently was that um, government agencies are considering how they can use some of this technology, the drone technology in particular, to police, their word, police the borders of southern Europe, stop the migration problem. Just think about that. Imagine that world where those migrants, those poor migrants who are trying to find a better place, a safer place to raise their children and to live, they don't even get to get in contact with a human being because there is a robot that deals with the situation. I'm very uncomfortable with that. And so I hope that you're very uncomfortable with that. Like I said, I wasn't here to inspire you or to entertain you, but to warn you. I hope that's given you something to think about. 
Um, thank you very much for your time.